John Markoff has been seeing around the corners of the future as one of the nation's top technology writers since he joined the New York Times in 1988. In 2013, he won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting as part of a team of New York Times reporters. He's a frequent host and moderator for our Revolutionary Series, and we love John for all of those reasons. But we have a special affection for John for other reasons as well. He is a child of Silicon Valley. He grew up and went to high school here. He started covering technology in Silicon Valley in 1976. His vivid book, What the Dormouse Said, illuminated the influence of the 60s counterculture of the Valley on the personal computing revolution, and he did so in a way no one else had or has. And now once more, he looks around the corner toward a new future of technology with his brilliant book, Machines of Loving Grace, The Quest for Common Ground Between Humans and Robots. If you're keen enough to catch the literary reference in the phrase, what the Dormouse said, you may also understand the cultural reference of this book's title. It comes from a 1967 poem by Richard Brodigan, which in its entirety said this. I like to think, it has to be, of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature, returned to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. If that was Brodigan's vision almost 50 years ago when he was the resident poet at Caltech, we're here tonight to probe the provocative question, loving grace or something else? Please join me in welcoming John Markoff. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. You're among friends. This is the home team. Hey, hi. <laughs> But I'm a little disoriented. I should be in that seat, shouldn't I? Yeah, well, you, you mostly are. And of course, my nightmare is you, you are going to start asking me questions, which is just going to be a disaster because I don't know anything about this, John. You're the, you're the expert. Um, let, you know, I mentioned that you're a child of Silicon Valley, and you've mentioned it a lot when you've been here. It's often something that, that gets interjected into your interviews. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, what has it meant to you to be a technology writer with so much of your personal... DNA coming from Silicon Valley? Well, what has it meant to me? Um, it took me a, a, a long time. I mean, as a kid, I didn't realize I was in a special pay, place. I, I had no idea. Um, I actually played in the Hewlett's uh, house when I was in first grade. Um, uh, Bill Hewlett Jr. was a classmate all the way through. Um, I. Uh, I delivered papers uh, at the house that Steve Jobs and Larry Page lived in. Um, I like to say, there goes the neighborhood. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 mean, I actually wrote my, my last book, Dormouse, because I actually left the Bay Area and went to the Northwest for almost a decade. And it was kind of an anti-autobiography. I came back and I discovered there was this amazing new industry, the personal computer industry, and I wanted to find out how it got there. And uh, uh, it, you know, it started as a series of oral histories, which I, I love doing. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, it, 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 it's sort of the air I breathe, in a sense. I mean, I, I, I grew up with it. And you know, it's also it's so generational. Um, I grew up with a particular generation. And now you know, the valley's moved on in a literal sense. I mean, there's a wonderful piece of research that was done about a year ago by Richard Florida. Um, who's a sociologist, and what he did is he geo geolocated uh, the center of Silicon Valley by current venture capital investments. And it, you know, once upon a time in the early 80s, the center of Silicon Valley, a manufacturing center, was in Santa Clara, and now it's at the foot of Potrero Hill. I mean, it, and you can, you can feel that. It's gone from being a manufacturing center to a marketing and design yeah. center. It's a very different place, and generationally, I'm, I feel like I'm barely in touch with it. I mean, I went up to the science section in, uh, in 2010, which is kind of a museum piece at the New York Times culturally. So uh, I, I, I look at it and, you know, I, I, you know I, I grew up as a reporter and you know, I re it was like swimming in the sea. I mean, it was, it, you know, I was, I was part of a group of people and now um, I'm, I'm distant from that, that sea, which ah. is still very much, is very real. And so in that sea, because you've seen a lot of other oceans uh, around the world as you've covered technology, and now science, um, 
before we get to the, to the robots part of this, have you ever been able to discern what it is about Silicon Valley that sets it apart from so many other places that are trying to capture this mojo? Well, there, there, there have been moments. I mean, personally, the moment I got Silicon Valley, there was, there, was, there was a point in time where I sort of thought I understood it, what set Silicon Valley apart. And it was probably in 19, 1981. Uh, the IBM PC had just come out. Uh, there was something called the Big Blue Computer Company. Uh, comp uh, Big Blue, com uh, it was a computer hobbyist group. Big Blue, homebrew computer, group. Big Blue something. They met at, no it wasn't homebrew, it was, a, it was an IBM PC computer group and it met at Dyson Odd in Sunnyvale. And you know it had the same flavor as the homebrew but the IBM PC was the new thing on the block. And I went to one of the meetings and you know there were, you know, Captain Crunch was wandering around in the back room. Guys were selling boards out of their trunk. It was the same vibe, except it, it was 300 guys in white shirts and pocket protectors. <laughs> and, and, and it was guys, you know. And, and um, uh, Evelyn Richards got up on stage, and she was a San Jose Mercury tech reporter, and she was really a, a great reporter. And she basically interviewed this audience of people like you. Um, and at one point she said, uh, how many of you people want to start your own company? and three quarters of the hands went up. And I went, oh, I get it. I mean, at that point, it was very clear that people, people felt deeply that if they had a good idea, they could start a company. And that was part of the DNA of Silicon Valley. And I, you know, that's really stuck with me is what sort of what separates um, the Valley. Um, I mean, there's other, uh, there's other bits of history. I mean, uh, so I always used to tell the story, you know, when people say, why did Silicon Valley happen here? Well, the first point is, uh, that Shockley came back here because his mother was here, right? So it was this serendipitous thing. And then there was this other point, uh, which um, I think is important, and that is the first AT&T antitrust lawsuit. Uh, one of the, the, the deals that AT&T uh, made with the government in the 1950s was the mandatory free licensing of transistors. That hadn't happened, no, no Silicon Valley. And then there was this uh, thing that happened in Congress that allowed um, the, the creation of venture capital. And somehow the synergy of, of those three things, mm. you know, I've always sort of said that that's what the Valley's about. Except I learned something new from David Brock, who, um, who wrote um, the biography of Gordon Moore, uh, Moore's Law, recently. And Brock was, uh, and this is in my book because I just thought it was a most wonderful piece of research. He was in the archives looking through Shockley's papers. And he stumbled across this three-page memo that Shockley wrote in, I think, 51 or 52, probably 52, before he left Bell Labs. And he made this impassioned case for Bell Labs to build something he called an automatic trainable robot. And you read this thing. As a matter of fact, Rod Brooks, who started uh, Rethink Robotics, Baxter, sort of stripped the, you know, he just gave his employees the text of, of, of this document, and nobody could tell you know, what the date was. I mean, he really uh, sort of laid out uh, the notion of what a device like Baxter, and, and, or like a, whatever Google might be doing now. And so the connection is that makes it important for Silicon Valley is he went to, to Beckman, of Beckman Inter Instruments. He didn't go to Beckman to ask him to make a, a transistor company. He went to Beckman to ask him to make a robot company. So there are robotics right at the root of Silicon Valley. I didn't know that. I thought that was striking. And he wanted uh, Beckman to build the robot's eye. That was the first product that he had in mind. And it kind of devolved into a transistor company and was set back. But the original vision, the original sort of, you know, sort of let's go was about robots. And so, you know, here we, have, here we are, That's 50 years later, full circle. Well, what a perfect segue into the whole discussion of robots. Now, th this book really seems to have captured a big chunk of the national imagination. Your, your book tour has been extensive, and you've been in a lot of places, and, and it's doing well. And I just wonder, what is it about our current, you seem to caught a moment where our current fascination with robots has met your expertise as a writer and an observer. And what do, why do you think that is right now? Yeah. Uh, and just for contrast, my last book tour involved driving to San Jose. <laughs> it was much smaller. Um, so I, I have a theory, and I can't prove this, but I'll throw it out there and people can tell me what they think of it. And, and that is that, you know how we, we make fun of the Japanese for being robot crazy and they're in love with robots? I actually think Americans are as obsessed with robots as the Japanese. We just don't acknowledge it. And the difference is that we have this love-hate relationship with robots. 
And you, can, you see it everywhere. You can't turn around without seeing uh, some sort of robot-obsessed component of our society, science fiction, movies, the, the whole thing. And so I actually think it's episodic. I mean, uh, this has happened periodically since the invention of uh, you know, modern, well, the initial computers, you know, um, uh, uh, the book Cybernetics was written by Norbert Wiener in 48, and then two years later, or three years later, he wrote The Human Use of Human Beings. And there was this alarm about the arrival of automation, and he had some very clear views about that. He spelled out the, you know, the social and economic consequences of it. And then you know, a decade later, um, there was another sense of alarm in, in the United States, and uh, the Triple Revolution people wrote uh, their, their manifesto about automation. There was a, a full-on government investigation into the impact of automation, and you know the Vietnam War happened, and it kind of went away because we got distracted. And then, uh, you know, probably over the last three or four years, it's spun up again because there's, you know, there's been this new wave of AI technology that's starting to work. I mean, AI as a field has had the most, you know, it is over-promised and under-delivered so many times over uh, its history, and now it's starting to deliver in really remarkable ways, and so that's created a great deal of anxiety, I think. I want to get to that, what you call the rise and fall and rise of AI in a minute in the book, but right up front, you say something very sobering. You say, how we design and interact with our increasingly intelligent machines will determine the nature of our society and our economy. It will increasingly determine every aspect of our modern world, from whether we live in a more or less stratified society to what it means to be human. Gee, John, it's too, too bad you didn't pick a book with some higher stakes uh, around it. That, I mean, that is quite a profound statement, and, and, you, and you deliver again and again in the book on sort of that observation. The other day, somebody asked me, what, what is it to be human? And I was like, what is it to be human? Oh, my God. And I actually, I kind of have an answer to that question. I mean, um, you know, humanity, I think, is, is rooted in the interaction between individuals. I mean, what is, what is human is this thing that is culture. And uh, so now we're getting these machines that are increasingly intelligent. And, you know, as, as a species, um, you know, we have a propensity to, to anthropomorphize everything. We talk to our cars. We talk to our pets. Um, as the machines we are building begin to talk back to us, I mean, you're going to have to have a science of social relations because um, uh, it's very clear that people will treat these things as autonomous, sentient beings, whether they are or not. And that's already happening. I just wrote a story, uh, you know, much later in the book, but it appeared in the science section a couple of weeks ago about this Microsoft experiment that's going on now um, in China called Zhao Ice. It's a chatbot. Um, a chatbot. A chatbot. It's, uh, you know, you typed it and it types back to you. And, you know, chatbots have been around since Eliza, right? The first one was done by Weizenbaum, and they've gradually gotten better over time. But now we're applying the internet, deep learning, big data, and, and there's sort of an uptick. And, this, and the thing that's interesting about Zhao Ice, I mean, I, I've been playing with the Turing test contestants for 20, year, 20 or 30, since 1991. That's when the Turing test. And none of them are, are very believable. Um, both Siri and Cortana are sort of productivity tools. I mean, the designers of Siri uh, built it to get something done. You ask it a question, it gives you an answer, you go on with your, your day. Zhao Ice is designed as a companion. Um, 20 million registered users, 10 million use it intensively. We're talking about multiple conversations a day, conversation being, uh, uh, being uh, composed of multiple interactions. 25% of Zhao Ice users have said, I love you to Zhao Ice. 50% have said thank you. Um, and it was even like cr creeping out the Microsoft designers. <laughs> and, and then I had this interesting conversation with a woman by the name of Michelle Liu, who's a, a, former, a former IBM researcher who's doing a startup here, and she's Chinese. And she said, you know, when we come to your country, it feels quiet. And, and, and in, in, in China, um, you know, interactions are so densely, people are in contact with each other all the time, and her view is Zhao Ice's private space. Um, they call it toilet time. The kids go into the bathroom between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. and have long conversations with Zhao Ice. Um, this is real. This yeah. is not science yeah. fiction. This is the world of her. I mean, we're stepping into her. Uh, it's, so. It sounds like her. It does. Yeah. Um, now, as we get into this, there's another important definition, I think, that you make early on in the book about artificial intelligence. You talk about um, 
those who believe AI will replace humans and those who believe AI will augment human capability, that dichotomy runs throughout the history of AI. It's, it's at the very root of the earliest days. Uh, explain why it's important to understand that replacement versus just augmentation. Yeah. Well, it was the puzzle that got me into this. I mean, it's, of course it's a dichotomy, and I'll talk a little bit about the history, but it, it's, a, it, it's a, di a, di a dichotomy and it's a paradox, right? Because if you augment a human, you also displace humans. And so there's, there, there's no easy way out of it. I, I noticed when I was writing Dormouse that in the early 60s, at the very dawn of interactive computing, there were two labs on either side of the Stanford campus. John McCarthy created SAIL in 1962-63. Um, at that time, he believed building a working AI would take a decade, 10 years to replace a human being. Um, on the other side of campus, uh, 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 Doug Engelbart uh, set out to uh, build technology to augment human beings. And it, it, they, were, they were really philosophically opposed. Uh, and I, I was really struck by that because those two labs really touched off two separate communities in, in the computing world, the AI community and the human computer interaction community, which does design centered around humans. And I realized the only solution to the puzzle is to use AI technologies that are desi designed to augment humans uh, as opposed to displace them. And I, f I looked for examples throughout the book of people who had crossed over, who had gone from AI to IA. And you know they're sort of interwoven narratives, and I was trying to do it um, through through these through these narratives because I'm I'm very much of the school. I mean, you know, I'm a failed social scientist. I, it's called social construction of technology. I mean, there is a distinct view in the Valley that we are in, here in Silicon Valley um, in the in the process of sort of uh, giving birth to some kind of a proto species in technology, and some people believe that it will evolve completely into a species that will replace us, and I think that's poppycock. Um, you know, I'm I, I, I'm of the of the school. You know, uh, Churchill and and uh, and McLuhan. You know, we shape our tools and then they shape us. And I'm sorry, a hammer is a hammer is a hammer, even if it has a couple billion transistors in it. It's a very smart hammer. And it's a tool, and yeah. that's the, the perspective that I take. And it, you know, these are tools that are designed by humans, and they have human values embedded in them. How much of that long-awaited and, and often disappointed notion of replacement of humans is behind this rise and fall of ri and rise of AI? Have we been expecting all these years that we were simply going to see robots that were human and and would replace us? Yeah, I mean, I you know. Uh, this propensity to anthropomorphize, um, are, we're, we're surrounded by science fiction that gives us these evocative notions of, of these machines that will be autonomous. And you know, for people who so subscribe to this notion of acceleration and these machines are gonna be right around the corner, I commend to them the outtakes from the DARPA Robotics Challenge that shows the robots falling. Um, that's ground truth. I mean, that's, you know, 25 of the best uh, robotics researchers in the world, funded for several years with millions of dollars, doing the best they could. And you know, most of them couldn't open the first door. Um, you know, uh, Gil Pratt, who was the DARPA uh, manager who, whose brainchild this was, you know, he wanted to create a contest to uh, focus DARPA on designing a machine that could work in a Fukushima-like right. rescue situation. His kid, Joel, said, you know, if you're worried about the, to uh, the Terminator, just keep your door closed. And I, <laughs> that's where we are today. Um, and you know, there is this perception that we're seeing this vast e acceleration, and I believe it's actually more episodic. We have seen significant advances, but truth be told, particularly if you read the field reports from the teams, there was almost no autonomy there at, at all. These were teleoperated machines with a small amount of autonomy. I mean, the kind of autonomy that you would see is in some of these guys, you could draw a circle on the screen around the doorknob and the machine might be able to grab the doorknob and if it didn't fall over, it could open it. Um, but by and large, and they had some walking behavior that was autonomous. So you literally could keep the door closed yeah. and be okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, you know, there are technologies that are out there now, particularly um, the sort of the last wave, uh, uh, you know, statistical, and big data-based um, uh, per per perception technologies like deep learning and neural nets that are, are really gonna change things, but I don't think it's gonna come as quickly as people think. 
You, you talk about, you call this out, this, this theme you're talking about in some specific ways, and let's talk about some of those now because they're, they're getting increasingly familiar to us, this, especially in this human replacement versus human augmentation question. One is the self-driving car, and of course we, we have one downstairs. We talk about yeah. uh, what autonomy is like, and you seem, you seem generally optimistic both about the prospect that it's, it's going to happen you know, relatively soon, relatively being sort of loosely defined, and about the social benefits. So is that... Is that right, and, well, and why is that? I, you know, I, 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 I continue to evolve on this. I, I guess I think that the edge cases are real killers, and that's going to keep us from completely self-driving cars for a long time. I mean, I think I made a bet on the radio the other day that if somebody drove me to dinner a decade from now, I would pay for dinner uh, in a self-driving self car. If a self-driving car dro yeah. drove me to dinner. Um, you know, Google went down this path, and the Google project has been spectacular. It's almost a million miles now without a machine-caused accident. Um, and yet, I mean, I don't think it, their branch point in April, I think it was, where they basically said, look, at their problems we can't solve, we're going to solve this other problem. They created this car that's limited to 25 miles an hour um, because they get into a different regulatory regime at that point, and it's got no steering wheel, it's got no accelerator. And the thing that I didn't think got enough attention, it's made out of plastic, and the windshield's plastic. And the reason they've done that is because when they hit the bicyclist, then they may not kill them, uh, uh, which I thought was, was kind of an interesting admission that nothing, nothing's perfect. But you know, I, 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 Google got so far with that project, and then they ran into the handoff problem. And I, th I believe, and you know, somebody may stand up in the audience and contradict me, but I believe that when they, you know, they had these professional drivers who would sit there like airline pilots and watch over this machine, and uh, then they began experimenting with giving the cars to their employees to go home at the end of a long day, and they discovered that, you know, they discovered distracted behavior up to including falling asleep. And, you know, that is a handoff problem you're not going to solve. I'm sorry. I mean, you, if you have to get situational awareness in a quarter of a second, um, there's no way there, anybody's going to be able to solve that problem for a long, long time. And until we can get the human entirely out of the loop, I think we should reframe the, the problem, actually, and not think about self-driving cars, but think about designing cars that won't crash um, per, to protect us from our fo foibles, which is a classic AI approach. And I actually think the automobile industry is going down that path. I mean, Next year, we're going to have super crews, I think, both from Tesla and, uh, and from GM, at least, probably others as well. Uh, and in fact, I think Audi's largely had this uh, in the market already, and that is the car drives uh, at, at, on, freeway, on the freeway at freeway speeds, and you supervise. But the way Audi, I, I, I haven't checked this recently, but I think in their uh, slow speed driving system that's in the market now, Traffic Jam Assist, where the car drives by itself following a car in traffic behind it on the freeway, up to and including 39 miles an hour, you have to touch the wheel every 10 seconds, or it, or it drives. You know, the lawyers got involved, and, and you, you know, if you don't do it, it'll drop out of uh, uh, that mode. And so those technologies are going to continue to wrap around us, and I think that, that's that's great. It'll make driving safer. Now you talk about this as a safety-oriented innovation, and, and you've just given some statistics on that. And you say in the book, 34,000 people died in car accidents in 2013, and this could be a big benefit to that. But then you also point out another theme which is in the book and in this larger area of robotics which is 3.8 million people earn their livings as commercial drivers in the United States yeah. and there could be as much displacement in a kind of unintended way as there is safety for yeah. the people who need it. What's, what's up with that? Well I think actually it, 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 it might be real and you know of course Uber is committing to this too with all their drivers they're still committing to doing research at Carnegie Mellon to replace all, all of their workers. Um, uh, there's an Earth, uh, I think it's called Earth Institute. There's a study at Columbia, uh, you know, comparing the economics of a, a fleet of robot cars in an urban area like San Francisco or New York um, compared to human taxis. And, you know, the economics and the efficiencies are just incredibly compelling. And it, it looked to me like a Google-style, completely elevator-style device that is limited to 25 mile an hour might work in that, in that kind of a situation. The average speed of cars in San Francisco and New York, I think it's 17 miles an hour in, in, in New York and 18 miles an hour in San Francisco. So uh, a 25 mile an hour vehicle is just fine to take, to take you around. And so that, you know, in those urban areas and campuses, I think these things uh, might come. You know, uh, 
there's a, there's, so yes, um, that would displace hum a lot human of drivers in, in potential. And you know, this has happened forever. The question is, does it, does it become a crisis? And there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of books have been re re written recently arguing that we are precipitating a crisis, that this is happening so quickly that um, there's going to be large-scale disruption and masses of human beings are going to be thrown out of work. And I've come to, to you know, uh, everybody's heard uh, uh, Paul Sappho on this, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. I've become much more skeptical about pace. Mm. Uh, it just doesn't show up. Mm. It doesn't show up in the data. Um, uh, you know, for all of the hand wringing, um, uh, you know, the the great period of productivity enhancement in the U.S. was a decade ago. Um, productivity increasement with all this technology has largely been flat over the last five years. How do you explain that? And then you you look at the economists on this subject, and it's all over the map. I mean, this this is uh, this is a, a reporter's dream. I mean, you can you can you know, on one hand, you have the International Federation of Robotics who argues that this this you know, the deployment of this robotics technology is going to create the biggest job renaissance in, in history. And on the other hand, you have people like uh, Moshe Vardy, a computer scientist at Rice, who argue no human jobs uh, at all by 2040. Well, he says he, computers will be able to do, robots and computers will be able to do everything that, uh, that humans do by 2045. Well, who's right? Um, I, you know, I've, I've read the literature now for a long time, and uh, it's all over the map, and I'm convinced that the things that will actually make this happen one way or another haven't happened yet. Um, that, you know, that, I mean, let me give you one example because so many of the books point to this. Uh, and and I, my, my point is that it's extremely nuanced, and we're not sort of, uh, well, two, two examples actually to, to get at this. Um, one is that three of the books, and I won't name the books, uh, cite this, uh, the, you know, this. Uh, uh, the, the, the Instagram versus Kodak. And the implication is 13 programmers at Instagram have displaced 140,000 workers at Kodak, you know, digital photography versus chemical photography. And when you start to pick that apart, the first thing you realize is that Instagram didn't kill Kodak. Kodak killed itself. It put a gun to its head and it pulled the trigger many times. And the proof of that is Fuji, its principal competitor, made it across the chasm just fine. So obviously something else is at foot. And the next thing you look at is Instagram did not come into existence until the mature internet happened. How many jobs came out of the mature internet? The best number I can come up with from, is from McKinsey, about two and a half million jobs. So, and many of them great jobs, right? Engineering jobs, technical jobs. Um, it just, it just is, uh, I mean, it's just a much more complicated su subject. One more story to, to that point. Because um, I was, I mean, I'm part of the problem. It was my reporting in 2010 about this next wave of technology, reporting on the fact that, um, you know, $35 an hour paralegals and $400 an hour attorneys were being displaced by e-discovery software. It was one of the things that sort of kicked off this frenzy. Um, and, you know, I, I, at one point, uh, I, I, maybe a year or two ago, I was having this art, uh, discussion with Danny Kahneman, the economist, and I was basically um, sort of, my hair was on fire about the impact of robotics on China, of course, which is where all of our manufacturing is going. What happens when robots come to China? And Kahneman says to me, you don't get it. In China, the robots are coming just in time. I said, excuse me? And he pointed out to me that China is a very rapidly aging economy their workforce is going to be shrinking. The Chinese are going to need robots in their workforce, and they're going to need robots in elder care. And then if you start looking at the world, if you look at China, if you look at Japan, my god, uh, China, uh, the, the US just had, I'm uh, the US, the New York Times just had this amazing article about ghost houses. I mean, you know, the, the Japanese society is imploding on itself, and it's shrinking incredibly rapidly. Look at Korea, the same thing's true. Look at Europe which is also aging very rapidly. The irony, of course, is the US is kind of an exception because we have immigration, and we're somewhat insulated from that. Donald Trump, where are you? Um, <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> um, you know, e the EU is spending a billion dollars to develop an elder care robot. And you know, if you look at the DARPA outtakes of those falling robots, you don't want those robots anywhere near <laughs> grandma. <laughs> uh, so we got a lot of work to do. Uh, to, so uh, it's, it's just a super complex and fascinating section. You know, so uh, for the people who are sort of worried about 
uh, about this problem. How do you explain that right now in America, more people are working than ever before in history, 140 million people? And people say, oh, but wait, you know, uh, labor force participation is declining, okay? You know, and, and you start to pick that apart. And yes, you're right, labor force participation is declining, but when the, the, you, know, you read the mainstream economists, technology is a small part of that, but there are all kinds of other factors. And so once again, it's very complex. I'm getting ready to ask you another question. Let me just remind everybody who's here in the audience, you've got question cards on your chair, so please, if you want to get involved in the discussion, write those down, and we're collecting those now. You mentioned 2045. I'm so glad you did, because there's a great chapter in your book called A Tough Year for the Human Race, and that's the one that you picked. 2045 could be a really bad year. Talk about why, what's supposed to happen in 2045. Well, I, I, that's uh, Moshe Vardy, uh, the, the uh, Rice computer scientist, has picked that year. Um, you know, his, his view of acceleration is that that's the year that you know, we're obsolete. And um, you know, that, I, so another thought about the acceleration question, because you know, I, I grew up in, in Silicon Valley, and I worship at the Church of Moore's Law. And, um, you know, uh, and, 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 you know the, if you believe in Moore's Law, uh, you know, uh, things get faster, faster. They don't get faster. They get faster, faster, and they get cheaper, faster. And the reality is just that we're at, at, at this point where we're supposed to be, you know, accelerating as, as fast as we can, you know, there's this thing called an S-curve. And, you know, the doors are coming off Moore's Laws right now. It's not dead. Okay, they're, you know, I think they're going to get to five nanometers. Ah. We're, at, we're at 14 now. But remember how Intel was doing tick tock, tick tock, one generation of, of shrink, one generation of new architecture, and they were on that, that curve for the longest time. And they just said, well, it's no longer tick tock, it's tick tock tock. They missed. And, uh, you know, Moore's Law has been doubling at two years' interval, uh, well, since he revised it from one year's interval in 75 for a long time. And now, look at, um, in 2006, Denard scaling stopped, clock speed stopped going up, and so we went to parallelism. Um, more recently, uh, we've slipped from two years to three years. Um, there's this phenomenon called dark silicon. Um, you can't turn on all the transistors in a, a modern microprocessor at the same time, or it will melt. And so you go through these elaborate algorithms. So if you don't have access to all the, the, uh, the transistors simultaneously, you lose some of the efficiencies. Furthermore, um, you know, uh, everybody in the industry except for Intel is saying now that um, the cost of transistors has stopped falling. Well, if that's true, there's no, ob you know, it used to be you'd, you'd, design, you'd get a design and you'd shrink it the next time around and you'd get all this goodness. You'd get free performance and lower cost and all these reasons to go that direction. Well, it, it, everybody but Intel says that's broken, it's stopped. And so, you know, the whole notion of exponentials forever, singularity just around the corner, I'm super skeptical about. And that is supposed to be the year, 2045, right? Ray Kurzweil. Uh, it's variable. I think uh, it was 2020 when, well, yeah, I don't know where Kurzweil is now, but didn't Vinji originally say 2023 or was it 2027? I, I, but um, that they're going to sure. crawl, crawl, crawl out of the lab. But so I had this wonderful moment. I was at the, uh, uh, the uh, Stanford Affiliates uh, uh, meeting for the semiconductor industry this summer. And uh, you know, Bob Caldwell, who was a former Pentium uh, um, designer, was talking about all these problems that they're, they're running into as they go down this curve. And at the end of the meeting, I ran into this computer architect, um, David Brooks uh, from Harvard, a young guy. And he was absolutely giddy, because now Moore's Law has slowed down and you're going to have to rely on creativity and smarts. It's the architect's turn again. I mean, so that's, I mean, there will be cool things that will happen, but they may not happen like turning the crank the way Intel has done it for, for 25 years. So I'm, I'm not saying progress is over, but it just might become a little more episodic. Let me ask you this. Where you, you, you have such an incredibly wide range of places you visit and stories that you tell in the book about AI and the development of AI and robotics. Where in the world right now do you think the most important work is being done? On AI? Yes. Oh, it's here in the valley. No, no question. I mean, you know, I keep, I keep wondering when a significant platform is going to come from other, you know, someplace else in the world. You know, Tom Friedman said the world's flat. Well, if it's flat, it should be, an, you know, an even playing field. And in fact, um, so 2006, uh, 2005, I was spending a lot of time in Europe, and it really looked to me like mobile application software was happening first in Europe. I was going, wow, this is amazing. And then the iPhone happened. 
and everything reset and it came right back. And I, I still expect at some point in the world there'll be a platform that will come, from, you know, that will scale to the whole world that will not come from Silicon Valley. But, you know. And what's driving it here? Why is it Silicon Valley? It, well, you know, apart from everything else that you've talked yeah. about that happens well, you here know, naturally. Uh, probably, uh, um, you, you know, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the dean of the information school, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, but she wrote a, a, one of the best books trying to explain Silicon Valley. There are these network effects that, that and, and a culture that you just can't duplicate anywhere else. And I, I think um, it's still very much alive. One other thing uh, before we get to some audience questions, which I know are com coming in a second. You mentioned Siri, and you, there's a section in the book where you talk about AI and the search for a truly personal assistant, and you draw a distinction that I just had to go back to. Uh, one is Siri, which you talked about, and I want you to talk about that here, too. But the other is the famous Clippy office assistant oh, yeah. from Microsoft. We all, we all remember Clippy. Do you remember Bob? I, I, I sort of vaguely remember Bob, but Clippy was memorable. So yeah. let's talk about Clippy versus Siri and kind of where we yeah. are on that continuum. Well, Clippy came out of some work from some people at Stanford. Um, and um, who believed in this concept of agents as assistants. And, and you know, as, as much as people, uh, you know, absolutely reviled Siri, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Clippy, um, you know, th there are some things that Microsoft could have done. You know, there was a cultural di disconnect inside Microsoft that I think really under undermined Clippy. Um, it came out of research and development hated it. They just, uh, you know, uh, what would they call it that? Um, that fucking clown or something like that. I mean, they had an. I, I, they they just absolutely hated Clippy, and it turns out that the code that it would have made Clippy less obnoxious, there was not room enough on the distribution disk, and it didn't slip, ship with it. And those were the days where you couldn't just up thing, update things over the net, and you know, and and also there were some design issues with Clippy in terms of social interaction were just were fundamentally wrong. Uh, nice try, but, but it basically set back agents probably a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Bob, uh, similar, similar, you know, sort of early, too early, and, you know, in a sense, uh, Google Glass probably set back augmented reality. It actually, uh, it had, it, I mean, seriously, it, it had a, a, similar, a similar impact. Um, but if you design these things correctly, um, I actually think that, you know, and correctly is design these systems to work with us as partners, there's a tremendous amount of potential. So talk about Siri now as a, as a system designed well, to work with us as okay, partners. Okay, so Siri is, I mean, you know, uh, Apple recently said that, um, that they're at a 5% speech recognition accuracy rate. They didn't define what 5% was. 4% is supposed to be what humans do uh, in a very formal way. But, you know, we've all seen these systems get better over the last uh, half decade as we've used them. And, and you know, I, if I'm in a quiet room and not around people, um, uh, uh, talking to Siri just to enter text is stunning. Um, you know, I remember um, going over to SRI in 1981 and getting a demo of pre-nuanced speech recognition, and it was called the Admiral's Advisor or something like that, a Navy-funded project to drive a boat. And you could basically say left and right, and it might get it right. Um, so that's in the space of 30 years that, you know, we've got these conversational systems that are emerging that are getting close to being as, as good as human beings. Um, actually, the, uh, so... For, for those of us who think m maybe it should be better than it is right now, uh -huh. are, we, are we just being impatient? We have expectations uh, well, that are too high? I, I, I think it's coming very quickly, and I think you're going to continue to see improvement. For on, on a whole, uh, the, the deep learning technologies that are accelerating this are there's more headroom there, and they'll get better uh, quickly. What's what's holding us back? What's holding it back? Why why? I mean, it's improving quickly, but yeah, uh, I've, I don't think I've done enough reporting to give you a. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not one of the designers. I, I'm fascinated by, but and I can see the progress over a very short span of time. But you know the, the point I'd like to make about Siri as as, as sort of a, as a partner and as design. I mean, it was one of the things I was proud of finding in the book. Um, both Tom Gruber and Adam Chire, the two architects of Siri, um, were really um, uh, you know affected by Knowledge Navigator. I mean, probably most of you, if you're Silicon Valley people, are uh, familiar with this Vision video that 
John Scully put together. You know, Steve Jobs, Apple's chief visionary, had left the company to compete with Apple at, at Next, and Scully had to have an idea. And so he went to Alan Kay, and, um, and you know, he asked him to come up with a modern Dynabook, which Alan thought was pretty funny because he didn't think the Dynabook existed yet. Uh, but he basically came up with the idea of Knowledge Navigator with some other people at Apple and this notion of this sort of intelligent assistant with an, in the form of an avatar that would help an absent-minded professor, um, which spawned an infinite number of vision videos in Silicon Valley, but that's another story. But um, I went to Alan and I said, you know, where did the idea of this conversational agent came from? And he said, well, it was simple. I was just channeling Nicholas Negroponte. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Because you know, Nicholas has this reputation for being kind of arrogant. And, but if you go back to the early stuff at Media Lab, a lot of those ideas were, were there. And so I went to Nicholas and I said, Nicholas, where did you get this idea? And they said, well, it, it came from Gordon Pask. And I said, who? Um, and so I looked into this guy, Gordon Pask, and Pask was this kind of really interesting British cyberneticist. So it goes all the way back to Norbert Wiener who uh, was hanging out around MIT during the 80s. He was a close friend of Negroponte and Minsky's. And he had this notion that human intelligence was situated in the conversation between people, which I found a very compelling idea. And so, I mean, I think those are the, the roots of Siri, actually, mm -hmm. which is a profoundly kind of IA idea. The first question from the audience was actually going to be the next question I was going to ask, which is kind of a happy coincidence, which is about robots as tools of warfare. Now, you write in the book that humans can be completely designed into or completely designed out of weapon systems. And that seems to be the central debate right now. So what should we make of robots and warfare yeah. in the future? I pretty much stayed away from it in the book. Uh, I just, it was just like one you know, path that I couldn't go down. But I've done a fair amount of reporting. Um, the US has had autonomous weapons in our arsenal before in the, believe it or not, in the Soviet era. We had um, cruise missiles that could go over the horizon and find targets without human intervention, and we took them out of the arsenal. And we're about to put a, a weapon system called the RASM, long range advanced ship, uh, uh, anti ship missile, back into the arsenal. And um, it's a really interesting weapon because it's designed, it, it's about China becoming a, a, a strategic power. And basically, our carriers are now having to stay farther away from uh, the area that they have to engage to be, to be safe. And so we've designed a weapon system that has the capability to fly like five or 600 miles, 300 of which it's entirely out of contact with human controllers. Now, it's called, the, the, the Pentagon calls it a semi-autonomous weapon system. And um, the idea is that a human being is involved in the targeting operation. Uh, and because a human has picked the target, and the robot doesn't pick the target autonomously, it's semi-autonomous. And there's a, a memorandum that was written trying to sort of split, split the hairs between what's autonomous and what's not autonomous. But that weapon system is making the kill decision without human intervention when it gets to its target. Um, there are dozens and dozens of countries that are designing similar weapon systems. The Israelis have an autonomous weapon system called Harpy um, that is designed to loiter, and it's an anti-radiation weapon. Um, it can hang out over a space, and when somebody turns on a radar and it matches its template or whatever mechanism it has to determine whether that's the target, it attacks it without human intervention. And you could certainly see that technology, be, you know, you could replace the radar seeking with the latest generation of machine vision, and you could have devices that are loitering over, overhead looking for particular human faces. I don't think that's science fiction. Um, as a matter of fact, um, if people don't know about JLens, there are now two blimps that are hanging in the air 10,000 feet above Washington, D.C. And they're designed to you know, do 24-hour surveillance against the threat, I assume, of a submarine-launched cruise missile attack on the United mm. States. But um, you could see all kinds of technology being put into a Raytheon-designed JLEN system in the future. Uh, I don't even want to think about it. So, you know, I, I, one of the things that really influenced me, uh, I went to this uh, conference in 2013 in Atlanta called Humanoids uh, 2013. There's a conference on designing humanoid, ro humanoid robotics. And Ron Arkin, who's a well-known roboticist and an ethicist, who basically can make the case for autonomous weapons, gave a lecture to the, you know, the, these, this 200 of, of, of the world's best robot designers saying that, you know, they had to take some responsibility because the, the component technologies they were designing to do things like 
um, the DARPA rescue robot could be used in very different ways. And he wanted them to take responsibility. And I think that's a, a really important, important point. These are human designed machines. The scenarios I worry about, so here we design this technology. Um, right now, we are conducting warfare by drones, teleoperated machines operated by soldiers who are in very convenient suburban locations in Nevada and in Florida. That's great when we're the only ones who have the technology. What happens when our enemies have the te same technology? Uh, it really changes the equations in really interesting ways, potentially, that I think might lead to arms races, might lead to the necessity of autonomous weapons. Um, you know, what happens when uh, small groups of dictators get these kinds of weapons and you can exercise control over a population without you know, with a very small group of people. I, I, I see scenarios that are particularly dark um, that, that, that may also be particularly inevitable. I mean, it's, maybe that's one of the reasons I didn't pursue it. it was maybe just that's the, it. The, the, well, let's, depressing let's, of a subject. Let's lighten it up then okay. for a minute because uh, there's another really good question here, which is what extent will technology alone drive changes in this area and, and what part's going to be determined by artistic and cultural influences like Hollywood well, okay. I mean, so I mean, Hollywood's already yeah. informed a lot of our. I mean, my two so. best examples of that, um, both Rod Brooks and Jerry Kaplan. Um, Jerry Kaplan. Uh, Rod Brooks uh, was a pioneering roboticist. Um, he 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 was the founder of iRobot. He's the founder of Rethink Robotics and Baxter. And um, Jerry Kaplan uh, was a co-founder of both Symantec, which was an AI company before it was a computer security company, and Technology. Um, both of them went into AI after they saw Space Odyssey 2001. You know, that's not the reaction I had, but they said, you know, I want to design HAL. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so I, th I think that, um, you know, from Knowledge Navigator to Space Odyssey, that, you know, once again, there's this sort of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a culture out there that shapes our view of the way technology will go. I mean, so, uh, you know, I read Werner Vinge's Gravity's End, I'm, I'm sorry, Rainbow's End, which is a wonderful science fiction novel about, uh, about augmented reality. And I, did, I mean, just, I highly recommend it. And I thought it was purely, pure science fiction. And then I went to Florida and I saw Magic Leap. And I thought, holy, holy shit. You know, Talk a little bit about Magic oh, so, Leap. So uh, Magic Leap, I mean, I, I, in, the, in, in, in the book, I, I write about Magic Leap because uh, a machine vision, uh, Ex, uh, expert Gary Bradsky, who was working at Willard Garage uh, when it was when and started a company called Industrial Perception, it was right around the corner here. Um, when it was bought by Google, he didn't go into Google. He went off to work at Magic Leap, and he went with the, you know, with the with the express intent of reinventing personal computing. And what I mean is, you know, it, you know, I'm in downtown San Francisco. You, you walk around the streets, and I swear to you, 50% of the population is looking down at the palm of their hand. That cannot be the end point of human evolution. <laughs> and, you know, basically, if you, you know, if you can make these things, if you can put intelligence into these things that we wear and you overlay the world with computing, I think that's plausible. And I went and... You know, Magic Leap was the first time I thought, well, this is actually possible as a direction for technology. Because you're looking through it. You're looking through it, but it's overlaying. I mean, it's putting objects in the world that are entirely believable with resolutions that are of the fidelity of reality. I mean, the demo I got, and you know, this was very early. And once again, remember Paul Sappho, never, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. Um, I saw this at a laboratory bench. Um, basically, uh, you know, while people have done stereoscopic displays, these guys are trying to create something called a digital light field which hopefully will prevent people like me who get virtual reality sick from being virtual reality sick. But there was a, a four-armed creature wandering around in space, uh, walking back and forth, that was as good as any HD display I'd ever seen. Um, and they claim they're going to get better. But we're, and that was interesting, and I could scale it back and forth. It was pretty primitive. But where it got interesting to me is my host ran his thumb through the object, and his thumb went transparent something was wrong at the level of my brain that they can't entirely explain. I mean, it was, it was very compelling. Huh. And so their view is that, you know, if you want, they want to destroy the entire Asian display manufacturing industry. If you want a high resolution display, you'll do this, and the display will hang in space. And I find that, a, you know, completely science fiction and completely compelling. Uh, who said it was that, you know, it was natural to sit at a desk to compute? Uh, and so if you can sort of 
you know, blend, you know, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous computing. Maybe you've just answered this question, uh, which is what besides autonomous driving is the, is the kind of robot you're most excited about using oh. or interacting with? So, you know, I don't have kids. I'm desperate for an elder care robot. Uh, yeah. Now, how's that going to work? <laughs> That's my only an, chance. An elder care robot. Well, yeah, did you see Robot and Frank? <laughs> I think they pretty much nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Robots as crooks. Um, uh, how's that going to work? Well, you know, I can see many levels of, uh, and, and why does it have to take an anthropomorphic form? I mean, most elders. Um, who are in assisted living facilities are in very uniform places, and you could see robotic technology that would do useful things. It doesn't have to look anything like a robot. Um, and also, I mean, you know, I, I think that uh, elder community might be the first community to use augmented reality. I mean, this is a community that's sort of bound in, to a place. If there is a technology that will let them travel in the, widely in the world and create real communities, I think that would, I mean, you know, I get excited about that, actually. I mean, I, I try not to be a booster, but I think that would be very cool. I mean, I, I've had two parents that I've sort of helped through, uh, you know, end-of-life situations. And, uh, you know, I, I talk about this debate um, between um, Dr. Aronson, I forget her last name, at UCSF, and a, 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 a University of Carolina uh, sociologist who basically was very critical of the notion of elder care robots. And she was basically saying, you know, the problem is not the lack of labor. We have huge amounts of labor we're not willing to pay for it because our values are all screwed up. And, you know, I just realized that society has changed enough that we're never going to go back to extended care situations where our in-laws are living with us. In our, it's just not going to happen. And if there is something that'll, that will sort of improve the quality of life of someone who's near the end of their life, I think, let's go for it. Let's, let's design it. Is this the answer to Elon Musk and Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and others when they say we need to be very careful about all this, that robots and, and machine, mm -hmm. smart machines are a threat? Well, so, you know, I think, you know, if you take, take a look at what Hawking has said and, 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 and what Musk has said about summoning the demon and this notion of sentient machines, self-aware machines that will somehow escape human control, um, you know, I, I, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen in our lifetime. Let's, let's be real. However, autonomy is a real problem. You know, the, 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 the sort of the, you know, the delegation of, of machine intelligence to devices that can operate independent of human control. And so I think it's great that they've raised the discussion. Um, we are having a real discussion in society. But if I was going to look for an existential threat to society right now, it wouldn't be AI. It would be genetic engineering. Technologies like gene drive and CRISPR-Cas9 that allow for the easy modification of the, you know, the species, uh, you know, by people with high school education, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Is this your next book? No. Uh, you know, that brings up another question, actually. Uh, you say in the book about this issue of control, the best way to answer questions about control in a world full of smart machines is by understanding the values of those who are actually building those systems. Now, how do we do that? That's, that's a very tall order. Well, it's, it's sort of a, I mean, it, it's my belief that these are human designed machines and they carry the values of the designers with them, which is, you know, both a, a point of great hope and a point of concern. Um, but that's what we can't forget, that these are extensions of, of, of the human designers. I mean, I, I, sometimes I, so a Stanford economist from the progressive era, Thorsten Veblen, once wrote this book called The Engineers and the Price System. And his argument was that, that technical knowledge was accreting in the, into the hands of engineers and they were going to be the new power elite. And then, well, it didn't kind of work out that way. But in fact, you know, the designers of these new systems are going to have a tremendous power over the shape of society. I mean, something like a Facebook or a Google really shapes the way we live. Um, and there'll be, there'll be other things. And so it's, it's a point of responsibility for the designers and an opportunity to basically design us in or out of the future. So I'm going to ask the first question last. Uh, why did you write this book? What was the subject, the nature of the subject that got you so interested in it in the first place? So, okay, well, I, I actually, you know, I, 
I, I grew up with, um, uh, with uh, you know, the personal computer uh, industry and uh, the internet. And I watched as they transformed the world. And I made, in 2010, I, I just sort of looked at what was happening and I said, you know, AI and robotics is gonna have an equal impact on the world. Um, you know, 30 to 40 to 50 years later, but you can see it start to happen and that's why I, 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 I went in that direction. Hmm. So, that's a simple answer. That's great. We like to have our authors read <laughs> their own work and we have a copy of your book right here. Okay. Very short. And a don't, place don't, mark. Don't, don't worry. Um, okay. Okay. And and well, so um, I, I mentioned some people uh, in in this par paragraph, and they're all people who crossed over from AI to IA, and that's why I mentioned them. What began as a paradox for me has a simple answer: the solution to the contradiction inherent in AI versus IA lies in the very human decisions of engineers and scientists like Bill Duvall, Tom Gruber. Adam Chire, Terry Winograd, and Gary Bradsky, who all have intentionally chosen human-centered design. At the dawn of the computer age, Wiener, this is Norbert Wiener, had a clear sense of the significance of the relationship between humans and their creations, smart machines. He recognized the benefit of automation in eliminating human drudgery, but he also worried that the same technology might subjugate humanity. The, inter the intervening decades have only sharpened the dichotomy he first identified. This is about us, about humans and the kind of world we will create. It's not about the machines. Thank you. John, I think we feel so lucky that not only have you written this book and shined so much light on a really difficult subject, but you, you've been writing for us for so long and we've all benefited from it now for so many years. So thank you, thank you. for that and for being so good at it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.